Hi, everyone. I can see y'all rolling in. So we're going to wait a minute while everybody gets here. And you can say hi to Douglas, who right now is in Malta. And thank you for joining us so late at night over there. I can see outside your window that it's dark. Well, here, it's the middle <laughs> of our Sunday brunch. And David Downing, who is here all the way from the Wade Center. You can say hello to him. And I'm just going to wait another minute. I love seeing y'all roll into the waiting room. All right, y'all, we're going to get started. So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe Book Club. I am Patty Callahan, and thanks to HarperCollins Muse, Meg Walker of Tandem Literary, and these extraordinary men you are about to meet, we are here to have a Sunday afternoon talking about the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Not only the inspiration for my novel, but also the inspiration for all of you who are here today. This afternoon, we'll talk about the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe origins, about the themes and the characters, and about the man who wrote it, C.S. Lewis. Right here, right now, you are meeting Douglas Gresham, C.S. Lewis's stepson, my favorite poet and fiery woman, Joy Davidman's son. And we'll hear about living with Lewis, about meeting Lewis for the first time, and about how Douglas saw Narnia as a young boy and even now. We also have the privilege of meeting and talking to Narnia expert, Dr. David Downing, author of Into the Wardrobe, C.S. Lewis and the Chronicles of Narnia, and also the co-director of the Wade Center at Wheaton College with his extraordinary wife, Crystal Downing, where Joy and Lewis's papers are kept along with six other British authors like Tolkien and George MacDonald. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has been called the most sustained achievement in fantasy for children by a 20th century author. But most of us just call it our favorite story. And I cannot wait for us to all talk about it today and talk about it with these two men. A little bit of housekeeping. The three of us will be having a conversation and then we'll be opening it up for questions. So while we are talking, you can type your questions in the Q&A at the bottom right-hand corner of your Zoom. Meg Walker will be pulling those questions at random and I'll get to as many as I can. If we don't get to yours, I am so sorry, but we will do our best in the next hour with these extraordinary men. And I am so excited about this also. We will be pulling a name halfway through, a random name, to win the seven set Narnia series, as well as a Gilkley print of original artwork by Karen Crawford of my main character Megs in Narnia. When I wrote Once Upon a Wardrobe, I was spurred on by the question, where did Narnia come from? What were the origins of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Of course, it's not a simple question, and it doesn't have a simple answer. I tell the story set in England in 1950, the winter that the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was released, through an eight-year-old boy, George, and his 17-year-old sister, Meg's eyes. But right now, let's dive into the book that inspired my novel, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Welcome, David and Doug. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting Good us, Patty. Glad to be here. So, David, I want to start with you. Your book, Into the Wardrobe, is a fascinating glimpse into the origins and particulars of Narnia. We can make logical lists, and you do, but you also write that Narnia comes from Lewis's love of wonder, of enchantment, of animals, and human nature, from his vast reading and theology and medieval schooling. So it seems as if Narnia comes from so many things that we just can't quantify or list. And yet there are some things we can ascribe. For example, the actual wardrobe is right there with you at the Wade Center. 
And of course, we know that's part of the origins of portal to the magical world. But where do you think the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe originated? You just asked me the question that you said couldn't be answered. I know, that's the best part. <laughs> yes, yeah. you wrote a whole novel trying to answer that question. That's right. Uh, I, I love what you did in the novel because in my book, I talked about various intellectual sources, classics, medieval theology, mm -hmm. uh, his Christian faith, his love of talking animals. What you did in your novel is a perfect complement to a, a kind of professor's guide such as I wrote, because you get at the emotional truth, all the parts of his life that obviously contributed to this wonderful imaginative work in the 1950s. Uh, I think one of the obvious starting points for me would be, he said when he was 16, he had this, uh, this image in his head of a fawn with an umbrella on a snowy day holding parcels. And so here he is a 16 year old. He doesn't actually start writing this until he's almost 50. Mm -hmm. uh, but they carry that image all those years. He doesn't break it down the way we professors sometimes do. But when I think of a fawn, I think of I love his love of classical mythology. When I think of parcels, I think of his love of getting books in the mail and all the stimulation mm -hmm. and imagination and adventure. When I think of carrying an umbrella in, on a snowy day, I think of the English climate. And uh, <laughs> Lewis loved winter. He said he was a polar bear. So in some ways, the seeds of the story go all the way back to his teenage years, uh, not too far away from when uh, the time he read Fantasties, this wonderful Christian fantasy by George MacDonald. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll let that be the starting point. If I continue, I think that'll take the whole hour. But let's let's say it certainly goes back to his teenage years. And I love that because that's the point is that we can pick these things like him saying that he had this vision and yet there's all these other little nodal points that right, we can, right. that we can connect to. And I'm meant to tell everyone that if you can, it's better for you if you put this on speaker view instead of gallery view and you only have to look at us, but Doug, let's talk. You are the last living person who lived with C.S. Lewis, or as you call, lovingly call him, Jack. And I want to ask you the same thing. You lived with the man. You heard him talk about Narnia. One of them is dedicated to you. So before we even start talking about your life with him, I want you to tell me what you think might be one of the seminal events in his life that opened the door wardrobe door? I think there would be several, if not many, uh, events in his life that caused that. Um, his love of English children's literature mm. flows through into his own life. Uh, and he, he evolves it and he gets, makes it much better than it was, of course. But he starts off in his young days um, writing books about animals um, that could talk and did things. And uh, I think there is a, a collection of his, of his works on that scheme available for people to buy. I've forgotten what it's called, of course. It's called, it's it's called Boxen. I have it. Oh, that's right. Yes, it in is. This, in this, in this. Well, book. in that book, you can understand how Jack slowly crept into this world, which is related to humanity, but is far superior to humanity in many ways. And I think that's what took him into Narnia. You think that started it. And before we came on the screen, I, I, I said to you both that in preparation for this week, I mean, I've reread it, you know, more times than I can count, but I did reread The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe this week. And it hit me that I've been studying Lewis for years between becoming Mrs. Lewis and my life and this book. And it hit me that the more you learn about Lewis, the more you see in Narnia. And the more you see in Narnia, Doug, you said, the more... The more you, you learn about Lewis. It, it, it's unavoidable. Um, but Jack, Jack was writing those books for very good reasons. Um, he, had, um, he had a lot of time with people he thought shouldn't have children <laughs> and worried about the children, among other people. But um, he wanted to write something which would carry the messages of Jesus Christ along to children without saying so. And I think Narnia books do that very, very well indeed. Um, a lot of his writing of that material came from his writing as a child. And he developed it as far as he could go 
without stealing the childhood in it from the people who might read it. I think right. that's and that hiding in the attic, writing it. What what were you saying? <laughs> uh, I was just going to add that he. Some people think he wrote it didactically, like I'm going to pick out all the important doctrines of Christianity, and then I'm going to find an imaginative <laughs> way to clothe those in a story. And he said his process wasn't that way at all. He said mm -hmm. he started with images of a queen on a sledge and a magnificent lion and a, and a fawn on a snowy day. And the images started connecting themselves into stories. And only as the stories emerged did the thematic content begin to be embedded in the story. So he wanted people to know that you don't start with ideas and try to clothe them with plot and characters. You start with images and slowly the theme will accrue as the story in, unfolds. I think that's probably very true. Jack, like many others, including myself, when we're writing, the story comes to us. We don't create it. And I think that's what Jack was doing. It's certainly what I do when I write children's stories. Uh, there, there's a scene in Patty's novel. I know we're not uh, going to talk about that, but uh, Lewis says, he didn't set down to write ideas and she the little the character meg says yes sometimes the ideas seem to be thinking themselves and i thought that was a wonderful way to express that patty i think lewis would definitely agree with that that comment yeah i agree with you absolutely and and there's this we talk about this a lot you know as as writers amongst each other and the two of you are both writers is that you can either fight those ideas or let them rise up and see what becomes of them. And the themes that arise are the ones that are meant to be attached to that. I think if we, to your point, if you pick a theme and start peg holing things into it, right. that you know, it, you can tell that that it's a preachy thing instead of a story. So David, in your book, Into the Wardrobe, you write about how Lewis most likely also wrote for the child that was within himself. I love this. He once wrote in a letter to a young boy, parts of me are still 12 years old. So talk to me about this and how you think this might have something to do with the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Well, when you read all the Narnia Chronicles in many ways, especially the magician's nephew, uh, the characters are set in Lewis's own childhood. They're not set in the childhood of the fifties. No one oh. is uh, watching television or listening to radio. And even the vocabulary, some of the slang in the Narnia Chronicles goes back to Lewis's childhood. Um, when I wrote this book, I sent the editor a, uh, a glossary for all of the Narnia Chronicles. And she said, oh, these are children's books. They don't need a glossary. And then she looked at the words like poltroonery and portcullis <laughs> and all these words. And she said, I think maybe it does need a glossary. So I think he is writing for the child within himself. Uh, and uh, even the in some of the other Narnical Chronicles, when you have a character named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved and it. And he almost deserved it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that kind of reminds you of Lewis's dislike of his own name, Clive Staples, uh, hence the, his self-chosen nickname, Jack. I want to jump ahead to another moment. We were talking about catalysts for the imagination, and a big one was the coming of World War II and children being shipped out of London. Uh, London was being indiscriminately bombed by the Germans, so they were sending children out to safe zones. They sent some of them all the way to Canada. But yeah. both Lewis and Tolkien took in refugee children from London, and I think Lewis really got to observe firsthand child psychology. And so he said, this would make a good story. So clear back in the, in the uh, late 30s, he says, this is a story about four children who were sent away of, from London because of the bombing and their names were Anne and Peter and Rose and Martin. Yep. And Peter is the youngest. He got one paragraph and then he put it away. And this is advice for creative writers, don't throw anything away. You never yeah. know when you'll pick it up again. So almost a decade later, he put that away and picks it up with, Peter is now the oldest rather than the youngest and the other three have different names, but he's remembering when he had evacuee children uh, there in the home during World War II. He, um, that was called Operation Pied Piper. That's right, that's right. And they, they sent the, the children away. So Doug, speaking of childlike, you wrote that in December of 1952, you were on your way to meet Lewis. 
the man who wrote the Narnia stories and of whom your mother had talked so much about that in your childish mind, those are your words, not mine, childish mind, <laughs> he had taken on the aspect of a cross between Sir Galahad and Merlin the Wise, but then you really met him. So tell us that story of knocking on that back door and finally meeting him. Well, actually we walked straight through the back door because my mother was expected and so wow. myself and my brother, but um, as we walked through the back door into the kitchen, Jack uh, with Warney behind him walked through from the hall into the kitchen as well. And I saw this strange looking, balding, <laughs> very, stooped man going through the door and he didn't look like a, a sort of prince in armor or anything like that at all which is rather disappointing but it took him about i suppose 60 seconds to suddenly make me realize that this man was very important to me and he was a very fine man and a very good man his clothes were the sort of thing you might expect to find on a trap I mean, <laughs> the elbows were sort of ripped out of it or, or worn out of it um, he really was not particularly <laughs> not particularly exciting in the way he dressed. Um, he was wearing slippers, the, the back of which were worn down by his constant heeling sitting back on top of them. Uh, <laughs> he didn't look like an, an important man. He didn't look like an exciting man at all because he was all of those things. It took me probably about two days to get to know and like him. But once that started, it never stopped. We Were you surprised. nervous of meeting him or was it more just you expected something? No, my mother had told me a lot about him and read us the books. So I expected a fantastic man in a, in a silver armor suit. and all of that. <laughs> It didn't work. <laughs> yeah. And Jack was hilariously, I mean, he laughed his head off when he, when he found out what I what I'd thought. Um, considerably a later time, considerably um, further on. But and Warney, of course, thought it was hilarious too. But I was quite yeah, very small at that time. And it was only a matter of, I suppose, two or three days before I got to like the man immensely. Um, I lived at that time, they put me in this little uh, bedroom down at the far end of the house. And uh, the plumbing wasn't quite as good as it should be in that house. So every morning at about, uh, I suppose it would have been about five o'clock in the morning, there would be a hammering sound in, in the wall as if someone was trying to break in with a pickaxe. And I immediately just threw my bedclothes over my head and, and, and pretended it didn't exist. I put up with that for every day of that stay there without telling anybody. It was a long time later that I told somebody, they said, well, that's all right. That's just a pipe, sh sh you know, rattling in, in, in the wall. And, Obviously, uh, you had a great imagination. When you, for that first visit, you, of course, ended up living with him when, when your mother and he married. But those first visits, when you really were just a visitor, did you see that inner child of Lewis that Dave and I just talked about, like that childlike quality, even though he never had any of his own kids, but for you and, and David? Well, David- Not this David, your brother, David. <laughs> you know, my, my brother never really got into anything about it. He wasn't interested in Jack. He wasn't interested in London. He wasn't interested in England. He didn't want to be anywhere. And that stayed with him all his life, by the way. In fact, he eventually died in a, um, in a uh, carefully locked up asylum in Switzerland. Mm. But um, I, I sort of got to like him enormously right away. One of the things we, he was doing at that stage with Orney was chopping firewood. Because we were still just after the war at that time and, and sort of anything to burn or create heat with was difficult. So they'd go down and they'd start sawing and chopping and, and I just grabbed an ax and started doing it as well, even though I was tiny. <laughs> And I sort of started that I was doing it all the rest of the time I was there. But um, now he was, he, he, I don't think there will ever be and all ever has been a man like Jack. I just don't think anything such like that exists. And there's a one off thing. But then the same is true of my mother. She was a one off. Oh, well, character. you know how I feel about her. I mean, yeah, there, I, there never I, was. I've never met anyone like her. And I've never met anyone like Jack. Warney was slightly different. I've met a lot of people a little bit like him, but not like Jack. Not like Jack. He uh, that did, excuse me, Doug. Didn't you tell us when you first moved in the blackout curtains were still up from World War II, and uh, <laughs> they, they weren't blackout out. curtains exactly. They they were uh, <laughs> these two they old were used, are living they were there. Used as blackout curtains, but they were actually blankets off beds. Oh god! They couldn't afford oh. to buy anything, so they ripped the blankets off the beds if they were thick enough and put them up as curtains. 
So we had curtains, then we had these blackout curtains. And there was always somebody who was going to knock on the door and say, hey, get that light out. And stuff like that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was the, the house was actually falling apart at that time. And they was, uh, used to put out their cigarette ashes on the carpet because they thought it would keep down the cockroaches or something like they that. They flicked the ash off. They, they threw the cigarette butt into the fire, but they flicked the ash off on the carpet because somebody had told them it was good for carpets. So I don't know where they got that idea. I think but, they uh, made that up, just like they made up a whole land called Narnia. <laughs> but... I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think somebody had actually told them in a matter of, of humor and they'd actually believed it. Because they were very careful to flick it on the floor over here and then flick it on the floor over there and then flick <laughs> That's awesome. but, uh, so, they, were, they were both very fine men in different ways. Right before we came on, we were, David had brought up a story that you told him, one I haven't heard, um, but it goes straight to the line, the witch in the wardrobe, because we talk it, in the book, um, Once Upon a Wardrobe, we talk about these seminal moments in Lewis's life that hide and find themselves in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, whether it's boxing, where he's writing in mm -hmm. the, little room in the attic but one of them is his time in the war and you know there's great battle scenes in Narnia and great battle scene in the line the witch in the wardrobe but tell us the story about you and 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 your stepfather Jack um and to show the ways in which the war never really did leave him oh that's that's it's rather sad it was very sad to me it was later when I was older and I was upstairs in my bedroom, and uh, one of the things we had in the house was was swords because my mother loved to kick, to kick, you know to, to uh, collect swords, and I still have quite a few in my house, some of which are illegal, <laughs> 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 probably. But uh, so I heard this sudden. I was upstairs in the bedroom up there at this time. I'm, I've lived in almost every bedroom in the house over the years, but I suddenly heard this this scream from below. And at that time, Jack was he wasn't well, and he was actually it was after my mother had died. He was um, sleeping in what had been the sitting room where my mother had been at one stage. Yeah. And I heard this, this roar of, of, of pain and, and fear. And I grabbed my sword, which was a nice, good, good strong one, ran down, barely dressed at all, and opened the door and turned the light on quickly with sword in hand. And Jack looked up and said, oh, hello, Doug, what's up? <laughs> I said, oh, Jack, he was screaming. He said, oh, I'm so sorry. That would have been reaction to things in the wall. And but what's the sword for? And I said, well, I thought someone was attacking you and I was going to stop them. And I would have been probably 13 or 14 years old at that stage, probably a bit older than that, actually, just after my mother died. Mm -hmm. And um, he thanked me. And when he told Warney, Warney started to laugh. And then he thanked me as well. So I thought it, was, it must have been considered as something rather good that I'd done. I just thought there was somebody down there who needed to be done, got rid of, you know. But it was scary but for me. It, it just shows that. It these things still live in us, right? These things that are happening to. to us. Trauma still. Yeah. We all have to have some ability to leap into the into the deadliness of, it, of things sometimes and try to put them right. I think almost everybody who's certainly any Christian has. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I see that, and I want to know what you both think of this, but I I see that in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, these moments that weren't great because there were really hard parts of C.S. Lewis's life, his mm. mother passing when he was nine, the war, yeah. the, the horrible boarding schools. And it's almost like his own kind of magic that he takes those hurtful and dark things in his life and he transforms them into this land that has become literally in many ways part of our universal consciousness. Even if you've never read the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know who Aslan is, you know who the White Witch is, and yet parts of him and who he was and his pains and his wounds, I believe, show up in that. I want to know. Well, they, reflect, they, they reflect in almost every fictional book he wrote. Mm. I don't think there's any way an author, a good author can, can avoid that. Right. Um, Jack was always trying to show people how these things can hurt and how they can get over them and how they can overcome them. And I think that shows very much in, in almost every one of his fictional writings. And he was very good at it. Yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah. F. Scott Fitzgerald said, part of the secret of being a novelist is the ability to remember emotionally. And Lewis certainly had that. I, oh, I love that. 
Uh, yes. Well, he takes the things like you, you have a scene in your novel about boarding school and Capron or Oldie and how brutal he was. And I think uh, he, he said in Surprised by Joy, Lewis said that sometimes you don't want to admit to your parents that you're afraid of someone. So you turn the, the ogre into a buffoon. And mm -hmm. I think uh, Capron, the schoolmaster, was an ogre. But I think he shows up as a buffoon as Uncle Andrew in one of the later stories, Magician's Nephew. So I think Lewis often used his own fiction for emotional healing for himself right. and for the readers. For his own knowledge, for his own fiction. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he went through, he went through a really, really difficult, well, I went through a pretty bad childhood too, but he went through a pretty, a very really difficult childhood for a long time. Yeah. And when he came out of it, he, I think he did deliberately, in some cases, use what he had felt and what he'd seen and, and been in, involved with in order to make it easier for other children to get outside of that. Right. Oh, I love that. Yeah. When, when my students, American students, read the Chronicles, they're surprised how negative he is about schools. <laughs> you know, Considering they, he teaches, yes. Yeah. Well, they, he wasn't, they, he wasn't they teaching that kind of school at all, believe yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you, once again, you capture it beautifully in this new novel, Patty. But his, his schooling was totally different from most American children. There's so much effort to have them happy and contented and stimulated and emotionally supported. And he had none of that. His schooling is like something out of a Dickens novel. The odd thing about it, what, what was really difficult for me, was that the, the first school I went to in, in England was still stuck in that kind of environment. Oh, oh Doug. Uh, not all the teachers were like that. Some of the teachers were very, very good. But the, but the bullying going on from older children was extraordinary. Um, we, had, we had a room there called the tuck box room because we all had these wooden boxes which we put in our, our suites and things. And, and we had our own little cast on them to stop people getting into them and so forth. And I had, uh, because I had an American accent, the British kids didn't like me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was about nine years old and I was, gotten, I was regularly beaten up until one day I ran away from them. I sat down on top of the tuck box thinking I was hiding. And suddenly the group, group of them came around the corner and said, here he is, let's get him. And luckily for me, one of the tuck boxes next to me had a nice little metal handle on it. I swung it from the floor, I smashed it across this guy's face. And I was never, ever bullied again. You know? I, uh, I bet I Lewis um, or Jack understood how you felt. If you Did you ever talk to him about that since he went through some... Later, of yes, later. He knew exactly what I felt. He mm -hmm. said, I wish I'd had that same... Ability when he was small, he went through the same sort of thing. But it's after I didn't that, have your sword at that moment, you should have taken great your shame. sword. Great sword. Sword. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think they let you take swords to boarding school. Oh, I'm just guessing, though. Yeah. Well, just in, 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 in a much older school, I took a, a shotgun once or twice. Oh, good <laughs> lord! I'm changing well, the was, subject. That was only to repair it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. David, I want to talk about watchful dragons. And you both alluded They're all over to the it. place. Everywhere you look, you'll find <laughs> watchful dragons. Yes, exactly. And people like night, neat, nice, neat categories. I do too. Appendixes and easy ways to look things up. But this doesn't always work when it comes to the imagination. You can't really codify imagination. Right. You, can't, you can't put it in a binder with little tabs. So I wanted to show that we can't ascribe meaning to every literal thing Lewis wrote as an allegory or a one-on-one -on -one right. relationship. There are you're, ways- you're right. It would be wrong to do so. Yep. So there are ways around those watchful dragons and Lewis really knew his way around those. I want you both to kind of talk about that. Well, when I was uh, a child, I did not read the Narnia Chronicles. I later asked my mother why uh, I didn't get them as they were coming out. And she said, well, Lewis was, uh, he drank and he smoked and he was an Anglican. So I just wasn't sure about his spiritual, uh, you know, sincerity. So I read a book called Pete and Penny Play and Pray. And every single chapter was good little Christian children reading their Bibles, going to Sunday school, uh, witnessing to other children. And it had zero effect on me. It was so didactic and so heavy handed. It was- And it was, so boring. And so boring. The only reason it was fun is because it was so bad, it was good. It was one of those like really bad movies. Yeah. Uh, but Lewis said that when he was writing the Narnia Chronicles, he knew that a lot of people had these Sunday school associations and these theological terms in their minds and this old King James English. 
and it was all very stale. And uh, the watchful dragons for him were this self-conscious attempt to be reverent and spiritual and to love God and to em embrace the truths of scripture. And he said uh, that when you, when you have your intellectual guard up, those ideas just aren't going to penetrate very far. So he said, perhaps I could tell stories to sneak around those watchful dragons. Uh, I think it's interesting the word dragon actually means watchful. Draco oh. in, in Greek means Latin. I mean, excuse me, it means uh, watchful. So his idea was to try to sneak around all these Sunday school associations. He did the same thing in his Ransom trilogy. You're right in the middle of a science fiction novel and you suddenly realize the Christian worldview is being presented to you. Uh, that the silent planet is a rebel planet. So he was, he was very wonderful at uh, telling you directly Christian faith in something like mere Christianity, but then using imagination to sneak around your conscious self and to baptize your imagination. Yeah, I think that's very true. I think also uh, one of the things I should tell you about Zach and his, and his uh, relationship to the church, I mean, the church, the church we went to, there is in that church a little plaque on the back of one of the pews and it says, this is where C.S. Lewis sat or something to those. Oh, I've been there. Well, when I last went to it, it was in the wrong place. Oh. <laughs> um, Jack actually sat down in a particular spot behind one of the massive pillars, which was between him and the pulpit. Okay. Because he couldn't really get through a sermon by, the priest was a very nice man, a very, uh, what we call high church. Uh, but he would always make Jack laugh in the middle of his sermon by saying things that actually were absolute nonsense or just getting something wrong. So carefully, Jack had poised himself always to have this seat with a massive pillar between him and I the love pulpit that. that he couldn't upset the guy. When I, later, when, when Jack had died, I, uh, I got to know the, the priest quite well. He was a very nice man. He just wasn't a very good priest. Um, but he was terrific as a, as a host. He was a good man and, and he cared for people. And he cared for me at the time. You know, I needed it. But uh, yeah, I remember, I'll never forget Jack deliberately taking me and he sat, sat me where I could see the guy, but he would be behind the pillar. <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. Quite fun. That's awesome. Doug, in your autobiography, Lenten Lands, which is so interesting to read, you say that during a very bad time for your family in Statsburg, New York, life was getting better and better for you when your mother introduced you to Narnia at bedtime. And I've also heard you say that you, in many ways, live life in Narnia. And you've said, I suddenly realized that after many years, Narnia is as present in our world as our world is in Narnia. Can you talk a little bit about that before we head over to live questions? Well, this could take about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have that. So <laughs> trying to kind of condense it. I learned, I learned an awful lot from uh, my mother re starting to read to us the Chronicles of Narnia. I think we only got through about four before we went to England and, and read the rest. But um, <clears throat> the thing about it was really, I think that I needed something. I was only small, I was only tiny. I needed something to grab hold of. As I told you, my brother was, was, my brother was actually psychologically deranged yeah. and he was always trying to do away with me. And at first, I thought that uh, there was something wrong with me. I started reading Narnia and find, found out that there wasn't much wrong with me. There might be some, but not an awful lot. And I began to wonder what was wrong with David. And it was years later, of course, that this all came up and we found out what was wrong with David. But it was very interesting to me to realize that what I was reading in Narnia after my mother had read the first few with us and I started to read, and I wasn't very good at it. But what I was reading in Narnia was what life should be. Oh, I love that. I love it was what that. life should be, and it wasn't. My life wasn't, and my life went pretty badly there on until we got until we got grown up enough to deal with it. Um, but it was very important to me to realize that this man, who I'd never met at that stage, had written a book about me, and the life in it was about me, and what was happening in it was about me, and I ought to learn to deal with it. And I think that was the starting point of me becoming, well, violent in some cases when necessary. Um, and later on, I was, you know, when I'd, when I'd already been beaten up once and decided it wasn't going to happen again, I wouldn't let those guys beat anybody else up either. That comes from Narnia. Oh, wow. You see my point? I do. And that when you say 
that Narnia is as present in our world as our world is in Narnia. It's because I bet almost everyone who reads it, I know I did when I was a child and I wanna hear from you, David, you feel like it was written for you, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Right, don't you? <laughs> That's the genius. <laughs> yeah, it was my, my uh, Well, yeah, my experience, uh, I have a twin brother and we were somewhat like uh, Warney and Jack and we always had each other. I, I feel sad for Doug that he didn't have a brother who could really be an emotional support through yeah. thick and thin. Uh, one of uh, George Sayer, Lewis's friend and biographer said that if you want to understand Lewis's view of God, after you, you can get the intellectual part, the theological part in mere Christianity. But he said the most well-rounded view of Lewis's understanding of God comes in the Narnia Chronicles. Absolutely. He's the redeemer, he's the creator, he's the comforter, he's the guide. Mm. And I think that's part of what we're responding to is something that we feel intuitively in our life is made much more explicit in Narnia. We say, yes, there is this benign presence in our lives, but it's more discoverable in Narnia than perhaps it is in our world. I completely agree with you. And I also think it's very important the rest of us realize that as with Aslam in Narnia, God made us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he made what we sit on and what we stand on and what we see and what we eat. He made the world for us. And so, I think um, that, that, that comes out very strongly in Narnia mm -hmm. with Aslam. Well, and I think that's why it's true what you said, that it feels like Narnia is in our world and our world is in Narnia. Yes, it's exactly. not just behind that Finally. wardrobe door. At the end of the voyage of the Dawn Treader, when they are, they don't want to leave Narnia. And Lucy says, it's not Narnia, Aslan, it's you. And he says, well, I brought you here to Narnia so that you would get to know me by another name back in your world. Yeah. And I think that's not just Aslan speaking to Lucy. I think that's C.S. Lewis speaking to all of his readers. I brought you to this world so that you would un Recognize. understand Aslan uh, by a different name in your own world. I think you're absolutely right, but I'd take it further. I think he's, he's teaching people to, to actually look at the whole world mm. yeah. and when, where it came from and who made it and why they made it. Right. It's right. all there in the Lardier books, you know? It's all right. waiting for us, I know. Okay, so there are so many live questions, but I get to ask one more because I'm in charge. <laughs> what was your favorite, is your favorite part of the line, the witch in the wardrobe? Not the entire Chronicles, but... I often imagine that October of 1950, when the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe burst onto the scene. Nobody knew there were going to be more. Nobody, you know, it was this singular book that showed up and affected every person who read it. And I try to imagine it coming out in 1950. What, what is your favorite part of the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Very difficult question to answer, actually, because I think it's also very good that it's very difficult to put one piece over here and say that's better than that piece. Um, it started with my mother reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to me, and also to my brother, who was always... My brother was, my brother was determined to be the White Witch. Uh, I'll tell you a lot about him. Um, but to me, the whole thing was what what my life ought to be about and what my world ought to be about because I was reading, leaving a, living a very poor life at the time with my brother constantly trying to beat me up or destroy me or whatever and my mother always actually writing a book or something and my father away getting information to write his next book so there were very few times when I had people I loved around around me and it, that was difficult for me and became less difficult actually funnily enough when my mother divorced my father and and flew across to, to England, or rather went across the boat to England, um, because then she was there and she had to look after us and she looked after me very well. But um, yeah, it, it was, I think I, when you, 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 what you said earlier tells me that it really is, for me anyway, Narnia is what the world should be. I love that. For me. And it was, it brought me up. What's your favorite part, David? Uh, once again, many passages, but I love Edmund's moral recovery. He's been a pill. Ah, um, yeah. He's had the Turkish delight. He's pretending that the Jadis, the queen, is good when obviously she's not. And even when he gets to her castle, he sees this stone lion and he draws a mustache on it as a <laughs> means of, of. But then he feels sad, even after he's done this act of vandalism. 
he says there was something sad and noble in that lion's face. Mm. And uh, later on, when he sees how she treats the picnickers, turning them all to stone, uh, I just love the feeling that someone who seems so unredeemable can be redeemed. Another great thing about uh, the Narnia Chronicles is people like Edmund and Eustace, they can be redeemed. They haven't passed the point of no return. So I just love that feeling of this little brat that we pretty much hate for just betraying his siblings. Suddenly you've seen this moral turn and he also can be redeemed. He can also uh, recover uh, through Aslan what he's lost as a human being. I think that's one of the most touching passages in, in the whole story. Yeah, I agree with you, absolutely. It's amazing the different parts that drive you know, home to us. When, when Tumnus starts, breaks down and cries at the first tea party uh -huh. and says, I was about to betray you and our friendship, but then I just can't do it. And there's this <laughs> right? like cracking open. I just, I, 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 that scene to me never gets old. Okay, we're moving on to some live questions because there are so before many. We go, before we go, yeah. how many times reading, reading the books, any of them, have you cried? Oh, probably every mm. time. <laughs> exactly. And, and you know what's so fascinating, Doug, is in different places every time. That's right. Right? And so in different places, depending, because what's fascinating to me, especially about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, is like all of his books and like books in general, they're living things, right? Mm -hmm. That they're, they're alive. And so they hit us for different reasons at different times in our life. What you notice one time, you won't notice the next. What you notice this time kind of slips by the next. So yes, I, I'm sure that you both have cried reading it. Yeah, of course. More than once. Okay, so y'all have been really patient waiting to ask your question and also finding out who wins the seven book series and the beautiful print of Meg's and Narnia. And it was totally random. And it is you, Debbie Stone. So you can direct message me or Meg Walker, and we will figure out how to get that to you. So my first live question is, we have a question from a first reader, a 10 year old girl who read this book in rough draft form almost a year ago. And she wants to know, Doug, did C.S. Lewis ever read pieces of his stories to you and your brother before they were published? Well, he never really read them to my brother because my brother wasn't interested. Yeah. But I certainly was, and he not only read pieces of Narnia to me, or lots of Narnia, but later on he would write, he would read all sorts of books that he had either read or he had written himself, um, just especially for me, and I thought that was wonderful. Oh, so the answer is yes. I'm just, mm -hmm. the imagining of, you get to call him Jack, we have to call him Mr. Lewis, but the imagining of Jack sitting down and reading to you is so profoundly <laughs> vulnerable and beautiful because people in general, not just men, sometimes have a hard time connecting and yet to sit and read to you, to imagine Lewis reading to you feels very vulnerable and beautiful. I really like it. It was difficult for him later because of course what happened was that I started to read uh, books at night when I was in bed. Yeah. And I would hide under the bedclothes after he had shouted the first time, you know, lights out, Doug, and then go on yeah. three or four times until he really got angry and said, put that light up. Oh, that's so, right. So it sort of backfired on him to a certain extent. But I loved it. Oh, that's really great. Okay. Uh, this I, Doug, could I ask a, a follow-up question? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Doug, did you ever see his feats of memory? You talk about his reading to you, but did he yeah. ever uh, uh, quote to you from his fantastic memory? Do you recall well, him? Yes, he, he, quoted, he quoted stuff to me when I asked a question about something. And sometimes he would take it on and on and on and I'd start to get very bored, depending on what it was. But he, he, could, he could read for hours alive. I mean, you know, he could read something that you might not want to hear, but it was worth hearing because of the way he read it. Hmm. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, he's, his memory was astounding, wasn't it? Absolutely. Maybe that's why he was able to put so much of his life into this land is because none of it ever really left him. Even one, of the yeah, one of the difficult things in his life was the fact, as you know, he was in, in, the, in the First World War and was yeah. blown up by, by, by a shell mm -hmm. and damaged quite badly. At night, sometimes, the, 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 first, the time the one I told him, I rushed out, rushed out with a sword in my hand because I thought someone was attacking him. 
he'd explained to me that he was back in, he felt he was, he was dreaming that he was back in the war. Yeah. And um, that happened again and again, that he was back in the war. And Warney the same. Warney would go back into the war, un, 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 completely unable to stop it. There's no um, way to stop those memories from rising. There's no way to stop it. Well, any memories you have that are that dire, that are that horrible, will come yeah. back until you pray very hard to God to stop them. And then he does. Mm, yep. In my case, it's a they live inside of you. Okay, mm. Jennifer Schilling says, this is not really a question, but I'm just saying hello to Dr. Downing, who was a <laughs> professor of mine oh, yes. during my last year of Elizabethtown in 1995. Yes, I remember Jennifer. It's so good to hear from you. Um, Terry Lauer would like to know, are the collections at Wheaton open to the public? Uh, they are currently, we're open 10 to 2 to the public. Because of COVID, we're having restricted hours. Uh, you can also make appointments at other times during the day. But you can come see the wardrobe. It's a handmade uh, wardrobe by Lewis's grandfather. Even the hinges are handmade. Inside, we've got Warren's army jacket. We've got some other fur coats. We're working on the portal to Narnia. We've had a little bit of a hiccup with the, uh, the portal part. But yes, we have the wardrobe. We have Lewis's own books in which he uh, made a lot of annotations. And it's fascinating so cool to, see to see how he responded to his books. I just read one this week where the man was making fun of Christian mysticism and saying it was a lot of superstition. And Lewis wrote in the margin, this man is a fool. So it was, <laughs> you know, he did not hold back his opinions as he was reading books. So yes, the collection is open uh, from 10 to two or by appointment. Um, it reminds me the first time I got to see your mom's, Douglas, your mom, one of your mom's books, Joy Davidman's books. Not that she had written, but it was a book Lewis had written that she owned and she was writing in the margins, talking to him, arguing <laughs> oh, with oh, him good. in the margins. Yeah, It's my favorite. Someday I'm going to write something about in the margins because the notes that she made in the margin of books that C.S. Lewis wrote intellectually arguing with him or and agreeing with him well you should, have heard, you should have heard them when they sat down together and, and oh started. gosh oh, yeah. i would have loved it was, it was actually hilarious it was very very funny because they were continually beating each other over and over again one way or the other um jack yeah. would say something and, and my, my my mother would put him right and then he'd put her right about something it was sort of bouncing up and down and it was very funny to watch oh two minds they played scrabble too by the way I, what in like every language too yeah. In all languages and with two sets of the tiles and one board. At the end, the thing would be covered. Just like give me a day with them, just a day. And occasionally, one of them would cheat deliberately. To just see to if see the if other one noticed. Just to see if they could get away with it. And I'll never forget, forget one time when, um, I forget what, what the thing was, but um, my, my mother accused Jack of cheating and... Uh, so they came to me and said, well, what do you think, Douglas? And I said, well, ask Warney. So Warney was called up from his study to come up and say who was cheating. And he eventually said they were both cheating and therefore nobody won, nobody lost. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It just makes him so human. I just love it. Yeah. Claire Efford, and I'm sorry, Claire, if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Douglas, it is so good to see you here. I remember meeting you many years ago aboard a masted ship called the Sea Cloud 2. We oh, were traveling that. the places that Jack had lived, and we even had a chance to see little Leah and look up the hills that gave way to the land of Boxen. Um, the voyage of the Dawn Treader, even, she's quoting, even in the midst of remnants of a hurricane. So this is not a question, but I thought you would love to hear that, that she remembers meeting you doing that. Well, I'm very glad to hear it indeed, yes. And one of the results of that um, sort of thing was that I went out and bought myself a boat in the end. And I'm on my third one now, and I do a lot of sailing when I get the chance in the uh, in the, the, Lord, the, the warm waters of uh, Australia. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, Anissa Armstrong would like to know for you, Mr. Gresham, did you get to spend time writing, you writing with your mother and Mr. Lewis? Well, they were writing. Were you also doing the same with them? I wasn't old enough at the time. My mother died when I was still very young, and Jack didn't leave, live very much longer, as a matter of fact. I didn't start writing, um, and I've got stacks of stuff that I've written, which I, I'm not satisfied with, but um, I didn't start writing really until, I suppose, all about 10 years ago. Well, I guess the follow-up to that would be, do you feel like 
knowing them as writer makes you more likely to write or less likely to write? Do you feel like you're holding back? Because I'm curious. Well, I'm I've holding back. Of that. Not, like not, maybe not, living with them makes it harder to write? No, not at all. No, it makes it a lot okay. easier. But the problem is I just have too much to do. Yes. I mean, I started work this morning at uh, five o'clock and I've been working all day on a variety of different things. And, and it's and, almost and, nine o'clock there. So, yeah. But at the moment, it's actually, yeah, it is five minutes to nine. Yeah. At night. So it's a long day, but that happens to me an awful lot very often. But um, I do like writing, but I've just got so much else to do. I mean, and I've your father was also a writer. So your father, your mother, and your stepfather were all very. And my uncle Warney as well. And Uncle Warney as well, of course. Okay. And I'm a writer. <laughs> it sort of sticks, you know. Yeah, it sort of sticks. You don't know. It sticks with you, doesn't it? Yeah. It's a. Uh, I've often heard this quote I love very much. I think Lewis would like it too, which is that writing might not always be the best way to make a living, but it is the best way to make a life. I yeah, very good. Well. Very good. Excellent. I like that. Um, Joy Buchanan says from, I don't know whether it's her son or grandson, but someone with her name, John is six years old and he wants to know how, oh my gosh, I have chills with this question. How big is Aslan's country? That's a bit like asking how big is God's country. Oh, I love God's it. country is as large as he wants it to be. And when he's in, 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 in Narnia, for example, it shrinks down to suit him. Uh, we do know uh, from the books, occasionally Aslan gets to be very big himself without any physical change. It just seems he gets huge. And I think his land does the same thing sometimes. Um, Narnia itself can be a lot bigger than we think it is. And then other times it seems to shrink. So mm -hmm. I think it's a very quite, very clever question, and I can't really answer it. Isn't that it's beautiful? It kind of made me almost get tears in my eyes. What do you think, David? Well, the famous line from, <clears throat> is often things are bigger on the inside than they're on the outside. Oh, I and I think in many ways, Aslan's country is that way. You get images of it in Voyage of the Dawn Treader and in the Silver Chair. But I think ultimately, it's probably going to be infinite. Uh, because it's an image of God's, uh, uh, the place where God resides, which absolutely. is also going to be infinite. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Wow. Children ask the most profound questions, mm -hmm. right? Most important questions. The too. most important questions, I agree. And sometimes the most practical questions. There's a charming book uh, edited by my colleague at the Wade Center called Letters to Children. And a little girl would write to Lewis and say, Whatever happened to those picnickers who were turned into stone? Did they ever get turned back into yeah. living beings? And he'd forgotten to mention that anywhere in Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. So I wrote her and says, oh, yes, yes. The same time that the others became living beings, they were also returned. So children can be uh, very uh, perceptive about the practical details of a story. Absolutely. And I love that. Um, Jennifer Erickson says, I am a fourth grade teacher, and we are starting book clubs next week. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is one of our selections. Your discussion has inspired me so much. If you have a message for the next generation reading Lewis and this book, what would it be? Both of you, I love this. Mm. Read it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, don't, I don't think you can go far wrong if you read Jack's, Jack's works, whether you start with Lion, Witch, and move right through all of the Narnia things. Yep. And then start moving up with these other stuff. As you grow older, as children grow older particularly, and even as teachers grow older, you'll find more and more valuable stuff in the books that Jack wrote, which were still, theoretically anyway, um, fictional. Right. There's a whole collection of Jack's fictional works that teach us so much that we really ought to read them over and over again. Yep. Yeah, I agree. The Narnia Chronicles are deceptively simple. Uh, there's so much Christian theology and classical and medieval elements. Uh, there's so many clever literary illusions, which you're not going to get till you're an adult. Uh, I'm still seeing things uh, at my late stage of life that I hadn't noticed in previous readings of Narnia. Uh, part of the answer to that question, Patty, would be after reading the Narnia Chronicles, I would move to uh, Once Upon a Wardrobe. Uh, <laughs> this is not a planted <laughs> question. I know. I know. Uh, but you really tell the emotional truth of his life. After you've read a biography, you get the facts and the dates and the characters, but you've really zeroed in on these really uh, important emotional and poignant uh, points in Lewis's life, all of which do 
uh, foreshadow or presage the things that happen in the Narnia Chronicles. So I would tell the teacher after you've read the, the Chronicles, go ahead and read this novel about the emotional truth behind the Chronicles from Lewis's it made own me cry. When I read it first, it made me cry several times. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. thank you. Powerful stuff. Powerful you guys stuff. are going to make mm. me cry. Thank you. And Douglas, you were so sweet to read it so early. And you too, Dave, and tell me where I'd gone wrong and where I hadn't and what it meant to you. But I think it, that is the fascinating part about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, about stories, about Lewis, is that we can point to all these things that are very real in his life that show up in this land. And yet there's these great swaths of ineffable answers that rise up. And, and make the story what it is, because we could all take facts from our life and try to make it up, but letting the mystical liminal space rise up in that story, for me, is what it makes it, you know, grow into Narnia. Okay, and we're going to do two more. Um, so... Jonathan Cooper wants to know, Douglas, do you have any comments about the most recent movie series being made? Uh, movie series of what? Narnia. Uh, I haven't heard a recent one. Um, we made three three movies, yep. um, which I was part of. Right. Um, you were a producer. This, yes. He's referring to the Netflix upcoming I, I think he's referring Netflix. to the Netflix series right. that hasn't I have no idea yet. what they're doing. I have no idea what they're doing. They haven't, they haven't told me anything yet. Okay, me neither. <laughs> um, so well, Doug had a, a, a cameo in the first three movies. Yeah. Uh, he was a voice in one. So, uh, Doug, they have invited you to have a cameo role in these upcoming Netflix films? Unfortunately not. No. I quite not yet. Doing it. Not yet. Um, I would like to see you as a centaur. That's my idea. I would like to it's see too you. Too small. I'm not big enough for a centaur. <laughs> okay. They can they can put you in a costume. I'm quite sure. Okay. <laughs> Sarah Thomas would like to know: Can both of you share your favorite work by C.S. Lewis of any of his writings? Between which is your favorite? Can you even say? Hmm. There are a lot of them. Um, Perilandra, for one, and that whole series, in fact, is mm -hmm. fabulous to me. Um, the Narnia Chronicles, of course, are just sort of wedged in my brain all the time since I started reading them when I was so small. Yes. Um, but I did. I'm actually, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm reading English literature in the 16th century, excluding <gasps> drama. Uh, at present. That's right. You're, yeah. you're reading Oh Hell. That's right. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what he called it. Yeah. <laughs> he did, yes. He did. Um, I'm reading it because. Uh, my friends at um, Harper Collins are about to make a new volume out. Oh, and they, they sent me some stuff to look at and see if I, I agreed with it. And of course I did. They, they do it very well. Uh, but yeah, I'm still reading reading it now. It's, it's a fascinating piece of, piece of work, but it takes an enormous amount of time. I was going to say, that's a... That's several a... hundred thousand pages in there. And also it took Jack a very long time to write it. Um, I remember um, your mom writing about when she met him, he was working on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it took some years to, to get it together. That was and, a talking uh, favorite book by Lewis. He liked uh, the Oxford history more than any of other Lewis's other books. Now, if you're going through one of those many pages, you'll find a minor poet named John Studley, who's describing the River Styx as a puddle glum. And Lewis thought that was very, <laughs> thought that was very humorous to have such odd phrasing. And of course, he remembered that when he got to the silver chair. I'm sure it is, yes. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, Jennifer Erickson says, oh, I would love to meet up with fellow Once Upon a Wardrobe fans at the Wade Center. Is there a way to connect? Yes, we're all going to be together, David, October 26th. Am I right? That is correct, October 26th. Okay. And we have a, a, a big auditorium on campus for you to come and, and do a reading and answer questions. And then we'll have a reception at the Wade Center. And if things go well, we'll all just pile in the wardrobe together. Oh, and, that'll be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> what are we, what is it, fraternity hazing? <laughs> <laughs> Doug, you think you can make it over from Malta for that? That'd be fun. I think I'm probably going to be still picking out olives at that stage. I'm not sure. Uh, well, the, olive, the olive harvest is rather late this year compared to what it has been before. But I'm getting a huge quantity of all our olives. We've got, we've got uh, a lot of green olives, of course. But then we've also got about 23 white olive trees oh, they're very rare and almost unheard of 
I guess I'm, we're going to have to go there, David. So. I'm, I'm redev redeveloping the the the, the, uh, the white olive trees all over, everywhere. Okay, I've great. kept y'all for a whole hour, so I want to close out with this question that's really beautiful from a woman named Sophia Herman. She says, I have a personal question. I grew up with Narnia, but also with Christianity that was harsh and full of fear. Narnia probably saved my personal faith. Till today, sometimes Narnia and Aslan felt closer than things I hear in church. Do you think this is wrong? And she has wrong in quotes. Absolutely not. Yep. Absolutely not. I've, I've run into people who teach. I mean, I've, I've often been asked to, to uh, speak in churches. And sometimes I leave the church with the utter disgust in my mind. Because not all Christians, in inverted commas, are Christians without the inverted commas. If you see what I mean. Uh, there are an awful lot of people who, who pretend to be Christians. There are an awful lot of churches who teach people not to be Christians, but to be one of the church in a their particular standard. I don't really like that very much at all. And I have often got myself uh, in situations because I have said so in one such in a church like that, where they, they really frown upon me. But usually there are two or three who come to me afterwards and say, I think I know what you mean. I yeah. think you're absolutely right. And that I had a, a, a wonderful experience with a, um, a Roman Catholic senior, one of the senior members, I forget the, the name, of it, who uh, asked me a question and I answered it very, very, with a great length of answering. And he looked at me and he got paler and paler as we went through it. And finally he said, you know, Doug, I think you're absolutely right. And I said, well, I'm glad about that. And that was all there was to it. I mean, it's just some Christianities are not Christianity. I think it's something we ought to realize. Not all churches are Christian, even though they preach. The kindness and the love. What do you yeah. say, David? Uh, I would refer the questioner to a, a letter, once again, in this book, Letters. I was hoping that's what you would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this little boy uh, named Lawrence uh, told his mother that he loved Aslan more than he loved Jesus, and she was concerned for him. So Lewis wrote this beautiful letter and said, it's impossible to love Aslan more than you love Jesus, because everything you love about Aslan is what is actually true in the historical Jesus. So he actually creates a little prayer for Lawrence and says, uh, please help me to realize that everything I love in Aslan is actually just a way of loving you. And then he says, please help Mr. Lewis not to write any books that harm children's uh, spiritual growth. Now, we, we had a... a, a a Zoom meeting at the Weight Center a couple of months ago, and that little boy's daughter wrote in and asked one of the questions. At least his oh, name was Lawrence that. Krieg, and his daughter uh, tuned in and said that he's doing fine. So apparently he got past <laughs> oh. that problem, and uh, now he is a solid Christian man as an adult. Oh, I love that. Okay, we're going to end with this. Debbie Stone wants to know, which character from Narnia do you relate to the most in your life? Well, for me, that's very easy. There are two of them, and they are the uh, the two brothers ha. find themselves suddenly being related to each other in the middle of that book, uh, because both of them are me in different categories of the way I behaved. Oh, I love that. Mm. I mm. love that, Doug. Thank it took you me a while to that. figure out why I, why I liked both of these kids so much when they were quite often fighting each other. <laughs> and the answer is quite simple. It's because one was me in one sort of um, side parts. of my life. Yeah. And the other one was me in another sort of part of my mm. life. Oh, I love that. I love that. How about you, David? Well, in terms of colorful characters, I love Reaper Cheap and Puddle Glum. Oh, I'll go along with that, yes. <laughs> yeah, Puddle Glum is actually based on uh, Paxford the Gardener. Who he sure is. Very, very commonsensical and solid person, but always took the, the worst and the, the, the bleakest view of everything. I he was the most kind man in the world. And actually, oh, I, I love like, knowing that. When I died, it was, it, was, it was Fred Paxford who kept me together. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Fabulous guy. And, but when the, when the really important moment comes, uh, when the, white, or the, the Green Witch is trying to convince him there is no Narnia, he gives this wonderful speech about, I'd rather be on the side of Narnia, even if there is no Narnia. Uh, oh, it's very wow. philosophically profound. <laughs> For a comic character, he really takes on quite a philosophically uh, deep answer to the Green Witch's uh, attempts to uh, confuse their understanding. I love that. It's, it's, and I bet through time and through ages, that answer 
might even shift sometimes who our favorite characters are. I think it would. I saw a man at church recently who was very tall and he had big hands and big feet. And, and I wanted to say, you know what? You would make a great puddle glum. But <laughs> then I decided that wouldn't be a compliment. So I decided to bite my tongue on that one. That is so it depends. Funny. Sometimes some men would really say, yeah, I'd love it. Yeah, yeah. 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 they take anyway. it as a compliment. If they knew right. who Paxton was, they would. Yeah. All right. I could keep you guys for another hour, but I promised you I wouldn't. So thank you so much for spending time with us. We are just getting these beautiful. Thank you for the lovely presentation. This was fascinating. And for those of you out there asking if it was recorded. Yes, it was. So thank you for coming, you guys. You've done me such an honor by talking about welcome. this book with me. So yes, very welcome. Thank Bye you, Patty. Thanks, thank Patty. you for writing a beautiful novel. They're gonna everyone's gonna love it when it becomes available. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, that means a lot to me. Take care.